Welcome. In this video, we're going to talk about HTTP, one of the important underlying technologies of the WordPress REST API and the entire web itself. HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and it's a standard for making requests and responses between clients and servers. Anytime you enter a URL in the browser and you see HTTP colon forward slash forward slash or HTTPS, then you're using the HTTP protocol or HTTP. Now, the other important thing to mention is that HTTP is accessible programmatically via languages like JavaScript, which we'll see later in this course. Now, HTTP clients is a specific technical term that refers to applications like web browsers or our JavaScript apps that we'll build that make requests to web servers. And HTTP servers is also a specific technical term inside of HTTP, and it refers to the computers running software like Apache, Nginx, or others that understand how to process and work with HTTP requests and responses. Now, if you've worked in web development before, you've probably seen this diagram of a client making a request to a server and in turn a server making a response back to the client. But what we're going to do now is unpack this quite a bit, starting with these two terms, which are again specific technical terms, request and response. So a request is what is made from a client or our app to the server. And there are several types of requests or request methods like get, post, put, which put means to update, uh, delete, get options, connect, trace. All of these are available and there's a comprehensive list. Well, it's not even comprehensive. There are even more that are available. And you could see the video notes for a link to get a better understanding of what's possible with different HTTP request types or methods. But it's important to point out here that while in a web browser we might be used to making GET requests, we just put in the URL and get the data back, HTTP allows for us to do a lot of other types of requests as well. So then an HTTP response is going to be what's made from a server to a client in response to that request. And now in the case of WordPress, part of that response is going to be in JSON format. So coming back to this diagram again, when we make requests and get responses back, we're passing what are called HTTP messages. And HTTP messages are the bundles of data that are passed with requests and responses. And they include three important parts that we do need to take the time to unpack and understand because we're going to be engaging with them when we work with the WordPress REST API. And these three parts are the requester status line, headers, and then the message body, which is technically optional, but we're gonna see it every time we get a response back from an API enabled WordPress site. So to start with our request, what is sent is called a request line. And this includes the method, so get, post, put, delete, et cetera, what we want to do. And then the URI or URL that we want to make that request to. And we'll learn about all the URLs that are possible with WordPress later on. Finally, it includes the HTTP version. And at the end of this video, we'll talk about kind of the history and the different versions of HTTP. But to give you an example of what this looks like, it would look something like, get this site with this URL using version 1.1 of HTTP. Or another one might be, hey, post this data to this URL using HTTP. And this is just one line, and this is sent whenever we make a request from the client to the server. Then in turn, we're gonna get a status line back from the server, and this is going to have the HTTP version that we're using as well as a status code. And there are five different general categories of status codes. One are informational, two like 200 success. If you've ever seen a 301 redirect, this is referring to the status code or the status line that's sent. Uh, 404 error or client error, you hit the wrong URL. Uh, there are a whole bunch of these, you have 400 through 499, not every single number is represented, but there are quite a lot, and 500 server errors. And you can see a link in the video notes to get a really good reference for all of them that are possible, but there's going to be probably a handful of them that are most common that we'll deal with. And you've already seen these before outside of the context 
that we're talking about them now, but they are part of HTTP. So the status line that we get back is going to look something like this. It'll be the version of HTTP and then whatever that status code is, the number and then the message. So 200 is OK, 404 not found, 500 internal service error. I'm sorry, server error. And you've seen these before in your browser. We're just getting into a deeper level of where these are passed and where that information is sent from. So now when we look at this again, we see, okay, get this site, and then it's going to send a status line back. And this would be an example of a request line and a status line. This is part one of the message. So part two is going to be working with headers and headers include metadata for each request and response sent so there's a whole array of types of metadata that can be passed and what we'll see are there are some standard header fields or metadata types that exist and then custom header fields can also be added as well and in fact wordpress adds its own custom header fields that we'll see a little bit later on so this is by no means a comprehensive list, but just to give you some examples, when we make a request, some of the pieces of metadata that are passed along with that might be what type of things it can accept back, if any authorization information is being sent with that request, like, hey, I'm, I should be logged in, anything relating to cache control, again, the type of information the URL sent. And then this last one we could see is a custom one, XWP nonce, and what that could be used used for is authentication to send information back saying, hey, I'm already logged into WordPress, so trust me here. And then on the other end, when we get information back from the server, we might see things like access control allow origin, which determines whether other sites are able to request um, information via the API, what type of things are allowed, information about the connection, whether it should stay open, the type of content being sent back, if this is JSON, um, the status code again will be included there, and then information about the server and what it's running. And then again, WordPress will add some of its own, like XWP total, the total number of items you're getting back, maybe the total number of pages if you're using pagination and that sort of thing. And as mentioned, this list is by no means exhaustive, but I suggest you take the time to read through the Wikipedia reference in the video notes because it's going to give you a better idea of some that are possible. And you won't understand all of them. You don't need to, but just to kind of familiarize yourself. And then as we look at how to review requests and response headers, we'll see again and again Again, a handful of pretty common ones and it'll be very rarely and only in specific instances that we really need to check them and or customize them but that is something that we'll learn how to do with JavaScript and, and you could do it with other languages as well. So coming back here, when we make that get request, we're also going to send with it a bunch of header information. And here's some information you might see um, saying, hey, I want to get back some JSON. You could encode it this way, um, accepting this language. And here's information about the user agent, in this case, um, using Chrome browser. And then the server is going to say back, OK, got that. Um, here's what you're looking for, but it's also going to pass us metadata. Okay, hey, you're at yourapp.com. You're allowed to get this. I'll allow you to get, but not post in this case. Here's your JSON, and uh, status 200 means it went through okay. So we don't need to know all of the different types of metadata we'll find in headers. We don't need to necessarily understand all the syntax of what's going on here. We just need to know that at the lower level runnings of HTTP, headers are the second part of messages. We see the request line and the status line that are sent as one part, and then we see the headers as the second. So now that brings us to the third, which is kind of the bulk of what we're really going to be dealing with when we're working with the WordPress REST API, and that is the message body. So this is optional data that's passed along with a request or response. And with the WordPress REST API, we're going to be used in JSON format for this data. However, if you just hit a normal URL on a WordPress site, you're actually going to get back the HTML for that page as the message body. So it doesn't have to be JSON, but it will be in the context that we're using it. Now I say optional data because it doesn't have to be sent, and we'll see that sometimes when we make a GET request, we're not going to send any message body data along with our request, but then in other but we're going to get one back. So we'll we won't be sending a message body 
but we'll get one back. And then other times we might send a message body like, hey, submit this post, and then we'll actually get other information back. So to look at this diagram, again, if we make a get request, we're not going to pass any message body, but we see that a message body shows up in the response that we get back. However, if we make a post request, we're going to pass in that message body the information that we want that post to contain. And then the server is going to respond and it'll actually give us a message body back with all the information about that post. This is just how WordPress works specifically. And the URL we're seeing here, postsite.com slash posts, that's not the actual URL structure that we'll see in WordPress. This is more as an example. So message bodies here. This is the third part. And if we just review this term again, an HTTP message is a bundle of data passed with the requests and responses. And it has these three parts of the requester status line, the headers, and then finally the message body. So this is the heart of the HTTP underlying architecture that we really need to understand about. And a lot of folks who jump into working with the REST API, you don't need to understand this um, upfront, but it helps a lot because you do get to it. And it might be really confusing because you might have built stuff with JavaScript or jQuery or PHP in the past, but you never really had to deal with um, HTTP headers, for example, or really understanding um, what the different uh, request or status lines were that you were working or how to format things to be passaged or how to format things to be passed as a message body. So it's important and very, very helpful that we understand this all at the beginning. Now, before we wrap up, we also do have to mention cookies. And if you've been even just a user of the web, you've heard of cookies before. Uh, you may not know that cookies are part of HTTP, and basically they just let you store small pieces of data in the client browser. So again, you probably know this, you may have worked with cookies before in your own application. If you've accessed uh, most websites, you've probably had cookies um, stored in your browser. But what you may not know is that cookies can also be set via HTTP response header. So when we make a request to a server and it says, OK, here's your data back, it could actually say in its headers, hey, set a cookie on the computer accessing this or in the browser with this information. And likewise, when we make a request to a server, we could easily say, hey, pull in my cookie information and send it back to the server. But the cookie information is going to be only accessible via these two bodies, the client and the server. So it won't be possible for other sites to access cookies from other sites. That said, there are security implications when working with HTTP, so we really want to use HTTPS whenever possible. And HTTPS uses different protocols, sometimes SSL, it's moving more towards TSL, for securing HTTP connections and the communications that are sent back and forth. So this includes the header information, the cookie data, um, anything in our message body that's being included, even sometimes the authentication stuff that we're passing back and forth. That could be very easily in these days intercepted and grabbed if we are not using HTTPS. So it's important to mention that we need HTTPS on both the client and server side. A client in the past for most of us to HTTP has been a web browser. However, when we start building JavaScript and API driven applications, our apps are actually HTTP clients. And therefore, whatever domain or hosting account they're set up and served with, it doesn't have to be in the same place as WordPress, but it should have HTTPS running. Likewise, your WordPress site that's serving it up and processing potential authentications via the API, it also should have HTTPS. So that's a lot of terminology I know we've covered so far, but I do want to mention one last thing, and that is the history of HTTP, because it has its origins in the origins of the modern web itself, and it's also not done evolving. So what's coming down the road with HTTP is still something that we need to know about. And the start of HTTP is accredited with Tim Berners-Lee and his team at CERN in 1989. And in the beginning, we only had get request methods. So you can, from your client, request um, information from other servers. But 
in that initial rollout, you weren't also able to like post and submit an update, which kind of makes sense. You roll out the basics first. Um, another interesting little history tidbit here is that HTML was created basically at the same time as HTTP. Because if you think back to the message bodies, if HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which is basically text that can include links in it, then HTML or Hypertext Markup Language was created to mark up or help give some more metadata to the message body itself. So instead of just being a huge blob of text, you could wrap it in paragraphs, headers, and this is where we see the origins of HTML as well. So the first standard was in 1991 with version um, 0 0.9. It had been implemented a little bit before this, but really you see version 1.0 in 96. And one of the things about version 1.0 is that every time you made a request to a server, it needed to open a new connection. And a request and a connection are actually two separate things. And with version 1.1, which we've seen in action for a long time, you could actually open one connection to a server, think of that as a tunnel, and then pass multiple requests back and forth, which is less expensive resource-wise than having to open new connections each time. However, in 2015, version 2.0 of HTTP was standardized, and here we see multiplexing, which is having a single connection and multiple requests, but those multiple requests not being affected as much by one another as they are with version 1.1, where one slow request might slow up other requests that are waiting for it and create kind of a bottleneck situation. There were a lot of improvements with version 2.0, improving this with multiplexing. Version 2.0 doesn't require or isn't necessarily tied in with HTTPS, except that we are seeing as a move towards more 2.0 implementation comes also more of the move to just have HTTPS everywhere because it's all around more secure, but there are some ways where it made improvements um, security wise there with version 2.0. So as mentioned, this is a lot uh, that we have covered at this point, but let's just do a brief little review here to wrap it up and bring out the essential points. First of all, HTTP is a standard for requests and responses between clients and servers, and it's used in browsers, but it's also accessible programmatically. We could hook into it with JavaScript as well as other programming languages like PHP and a lot more that we'll look at. And then we talked about HTTP messages and how they include request or status lines, headers, and message bodies. And it's important that we understand these three parts as we get deeper into the WordPress REST API and really using it and interacting with it. We also mentioned HTTP cookies and how they're part of this whole infrastructure and how they allow us to store data in the user browser. And again, we will see cookies being used in different implementations around the API. Finally, just a message on HTTPS and security and that you really want to move to having it everywhere so that we could have more secure connections and communications between our clients and servers. So this has been a lot of information. If this is new to you, you could go back and rewatch this video just to kind of let these terms sink in. But if you've kind of heard about this stuff before, hopefully it brought a new level to your understanding. But then in the next video, we're gonna start looking at different ways that we could really start making HTTP requests. And all of this will start making more sense as we get into it in more depth and in different ways.